You ever grow up Catholic? No. Yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, for the rest of you, I don't recommend it. I just I went I grew up Catholic. I went to Our Lady of um, Relative Humidity. And, uh, I don't wasn't paying attention. I don't. It was something like that. Saint Nicola of the Drunk. Something like that. Anyway, I, don't, I don't remember. So. You don't. You don't join the Catholic Church. No one goes. Ooh, boredom and guilt. I'm in. You're born Catholic. You're born into it. As big Catholic family man, you're. We're all big. I'm seventh out of eight kids. Which means that there were six people in my family who got to wear my clothes before I did. Do you have any idea what it's like to put on underwear? It's, it's got somebody else's name on the label. Linda? It's just, that ain't right. right? It's not right. You got Lent. Lent's a big Catholic thing, you know. That Kids love that because for 40 days you give up stuff. And it's like, what are you giving up, Paul? What are you giving up for Lent? I think I'm going to give up Lent. I'm going to give up Lent for Lent. I'm going to give up the rosary. I'm going to give up organized religion. How about that? I'm going to give up priests slow dancing with me. I'm going to give up that. That's what I'm going to give up for Lent. That's what I want to give up. Nicholas Copernicus, the father of modern astronomy. Nicholas Copernicus was born in Torun, Poland, an ancient town located on the Vistula River. He was born in 1473 to a family of merchants. After the death of his father at age 10, Copernicus was cared for by his uncle, a Catholic bishop. His uncle took great care to ensure that Copernicus received the best education. After completing his early schooling, Copernicus entered the University of Krakow, then to Italy to study medicine and church law at the University of Bologna. He was preparing for a church career, and as part of his studies, was educated in astronomy. It was important for priests and doctors to be able to read the stars and predict future events. Copernicus proved to be creative and open-minded towards new ideas, even if it meant challenging old ones. Father, um, I've got an article here, 
entitled Two Eminent Churchmen Agree, yes. uh, that there actually is, this is a shocker to a lot of people, yes. uh, that there is, there are satanic practices going on at the Vatican. Could that be true? Yes. You want, you want to say that? Uh, if I was a lawyer and you were on the witness chair, I'd say, would you say it? <laughs> it's out loud, yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Now, when we say in the Vatican, it's at a certain level. And um, there's no doubt about it that there have been and still are practices that are uh, formally uh, venerating Lucifer, the prince of this world. There's no doubt about that. The people who are um, hanging out at the United Nations are just simply, in a nutshell, one word, they're Luciferian. And uh, yeah, I'm just sorry to report that, but that's just what it is. And so all of the people today who are, who are promoting the United Nations and the concept of world government, whether they know it or whether they don't, whether they're doing it for money or whether they're doing it for power or for whatever reason they're doing it, they are promoting the philosophy and the religion of the Antichrist. In 1986, Pope John Paul II gathered in Assisi, Italy, the leaders of the world's major religions to pray for peace. There were snake worshippers, fire worshippers, spiritists, animists, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, North American witch doctors. I watched in astonishment as they walked to the microphone to pray. The Pope said they were all praying to the same God and that their prayers were creating a spiritual energy that was bringing about a new climate for peace. John Paul II allowed his good friend the Dalai Lama to put the Buddha on the altar in St. Peter's Church in Assisi and with his monks to have a Buddhist worship ceremony there while Shintoists chanted and rang their bells outside. The prophesied world religion is in the process of being formed before our eyes and the Vatican is the headquarters of the world. After a while, the drums, chants, and prayers representing many of the world's leading religions all started to sound alike, somehow losing their flavor in a melting pot of spiritual soup. The first ever Millennium World Peace Summit of Religious and Spiritual Leaders took place at the United Nations in August, and some believe it marked the first major step toward a movement to usher in a global spiritual body that may one day speak for all religions. Robert McGinnis with the Family Research Council says it appears the hidden agenda is to unite people under one religious organization so they will peacefully accept UN goals such as population control, abortion rights, and one world government. A new world order, a civilization of love can be achieved. May God guide us and bless us as we strive to walk together hand in hand and build together a world of peace. Ambassador, um, everybody's calling for global currency. I think part of this is a game, but I think also part of it is a... I mean, now the UN is saying, you know what, we should have a global currency. Pope Benedict XVI is calling for a new world financial order. It's also a movement to tie the entire globe together into one big government. Well, now there's call for America to give up our dollar for a global currency. Gee, I think I've read that in a book somewhere. Oh, I would think. The Bible. The Bible. The Bible. And down below, here he is meeting with members of the Trilateral Commission. Steering committee, male members of the Council on Foreign Relations, a bunch of Marxist hoodlums made up of people like Zygmunt Brzezinski and David Rockefeller, and CEOs, Henry Kissinger. Here he is getting a little bless blessing from one of the adorers of Shiva Bombay. <clears throat> Something is wrong. Do we not recognize something is wrong? I know all you do, but you know, you show these pictures to somebody at, outside a Novus Ordo church and they say, well, what's the problem? This is at a Buddhist temple. I'll give you the date, May 10th, 1984. This ethnic cleansing that you're hearing about 
is Christian cleansing throughout the world. And as the Antichrist becomes more powerful, you're just simply going to see more and more and more of it. Now here, we have a picture of John Paul II hand in hand with the communist 33rd degree Mason, Nelson Mandela. So most all the blacks think that Nelson Mandela is, is a great, the great black hope to South Africa. Here he is shaking hands with the communist, Mikhail Gorbachev, who's also a Mason. We are in the middle of spiritual warfare. But the point is that I think some of us at least are here because we realize that there's a real problem today. But to people who are on the outside looking in, this is not what they see. They're watching leadership, leadership of the Catholic Church meet with members of the Communist Party, like Togliata in Italy. And they're asking themselves, how can this be? I think we're in the last days. How we got here is anybody's guess, I suppose. Those who hate evil, I don't think support it. And those who understand false religions, I don't think, hang around with members of the occult. The question of how and why the United Nations is the crux of the great conspiracy to destroy the sovereignty of the United States and the enslavement of the American people within a UN One World Dictatorship is a complete and unknown mystery to the vast majority of the American people. The reason for this unawareness of the frightening danger to our country and to the entire free world is simple. The masterminds behind this great conspiracy have absolute control of all of our mass communications media, especially television, the radio, the press, and Hollywood. We all know that our State Department, the Pentagon, and the White House have brazenly proclaimed that they have the right and the power to manage the news, to tell us not the truth, but what they want us to believe. I want to talk to you for a moment about something that's very important, the coming one world religion and the danger of the coming one world religion. Both the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ warned that in the last days, and we're in the last days, that there would be false Christs, false messiahs, false prophets, false teachers, and that even Satan himself sends his ministers as angels of light when in actuality they're fallen angels. It's important to understand that not every supernatural experience, not every miracle, not everybody who claims to be from God, but when you look at what they're writing and, and teaching, it contradicts what the Bible says. In other words, it's teaching a message that's the exact opposite of what the Old Testament and New Testament say. Now, the Apostle Paul has taught us, as well as Jesus, that when a spiritual teacher or a spiritual movement arises, even though they use the word miracles, and if they use the word Son of God and Jesus, or they say they have a prophecy, or they say they've had a revelation, or God did this, or God did that through them, and that the world is going to become one, and we're entering the age of Aquarius, and we're going to have a new one world religion and a beautiful one world government. These are wolves in sheep's clothing. These are the false prophets that the Apostle Paul warned us about that would come in increasing number in the last days. <laughs>